My name is Kevin Brazil, and I'm the uh, Professor of Palliative Care in the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Queen's University, Belfast. But uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Sheila Payne, who is uh, spending an hour with us to, talk, to speak to this particular presentation. But I'd like to share with you her background. Uh, Professor Sheila Payne is a health psychologist with a background in nursing. She is the co-director of the International Observatory on End-of-Life Care at Lancaster University. She is also the president of the European Association of Palliative Care. Professor Payne has a long track record in palliative care research and scholarship. Her research focuses on palliative and end-of-life care to older persons, and she currently holds five European Commission-funded grants into major international awards and has supervised over 30 students, PhD students. She's also published widely in ac academic and professional journals and books. So, 11 books actually. And uh, this is the presentation. And I'd like to warmly welcome, join me in welcoming Dr. Professor Payne. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you so much for coming out on this uh, rather dark and windy and stormy night. So uh, I hope what I'm going to talk about is uh, worthwhile and interesting for you. And I'll be really interested to hear your comments later on. I'm going to particularly focus on language and the use of language. And I'm going to draw on a study which I've done with my colleagues in linguistics and computer science. Not that I'm a linguist or a computer scientist. Um, but they work at Lancaster University, and we were really fortunate to get an ESRC award. Uh, and so I'm going to draw on some of their data to tell you a bit about what we found to do with the use of metaphor, and then draw that back in to think about what does that mean for us as clinicians. Can everybody hear me to start with? Is that all right? Yeah, and to see this. I'm going to see if I can make the technology work. Great. Okay. So I'm going to talk a bit about metaphor, and I'll explain what metaphors are, uh, explain a bit about how we did the study, so let, and I'm going to tell you about um, whether or not metaphors of a good or a bad death, what do we mean by those things? And metaphors are both used by health professionals and family caregivers and patients. And I'm going to focus on two sorts of metaphors. There's lots and lots of metaphors that will be used. Uh, and we use metaphor all the time in, in English, and it's used in other languages. Um, but I'm going to focus on what I call violence metaphors and journey metaphors, because they're the ones that you commonly see in cancer care. Uh, and I'll think about what that means for us when we communicate with people. So why does language matter in healthcare? And I think in 2008, let me remind you, I'm sure you'll be very familiar with the end of life ca uh, care strategy. And that at that time was for England and Wales. And I know that you've worked on one in, in Northern Ireland. But that used uh, metaphors throughout which were not violence metaphors, things about fighting, but were journey metaphors. And is that a good thing? So that's the question. And we also uh, have dying matters, which came out of the strategy. So that was about public involvement, getting the public to, to be more open about talking about end of life um, and uh, uh, and being ready to discuss their preferences and wishes, both with their family members, other people in the public, but with their health professionals too. And much more recently, in 2013, the um, EAPC, the European Association for Palliative Care, launched um, the Prague Charter. And in this charter, which uh, we, we launched at a conference in, in Prague, it urged governments to recognize palliative care as a human right. So once again, the language is quite important. So that's a little bit about our background. I'm not sure how many people have read this document, but I expect many of you are absolutely aware of it. And this is the document that, uh, that was the outcome of the review on the Liverpool Care Pathway. 
And the reason I've got it up here, not that I'm going to talk about the Liverpool Care Pathway, is because one of the key findings in this document, and was noted by the panel, was how wrong health professionals got the language of end-of-life care communication. So most patients, fam family members, did not complain about technical aspects of care. They complained about a lack of communication, a lack of understanding, and an insensitivity about the terminology that was used. And many people highlighted that as really quite problematic. So it's up to our, for example, hello. Um, we, I remember sitting down in an international group of students at Lancaster and we were starting by getting people to introduce themselves and this lovely nurse who was from the UK said, I'm the end of life care facilitator because that was her job. And there was kind of like a gasp of horror from some of the other students because they thought she was the euthanasia nurse. And you see, they were all, everybody sitting around the room were health professionals, but they were from different countries. And they completely misunderstood what this person's role were. She explained it very well later. <laughs> but how, and, and perhaps it's not surprising then, when we talk with the public in the language that is familiar to us as health professionals, why we don't always understand the language that they use or the metaphors that they draw on or the implications for that. So that's why language is important. So the questions that we were asking were about how do members of different groups, so we, the groups that we, we used were health professionals, so doctors and nurses and other health professionals, patients and family carers, use metaphor to talk about their experiences and attitudes and expectations. And this is, um, uh, we, we, I'll explain how we collected all this data soon. And this was publicly available data, or some of it was data that we collected from previous studies. So we didn't set out to collect new data. The only interviews that we did that were new were with a group of health professionals. And I think the way in which end-of-life care is experienced and talked about can shed some lights on people's understandings, what they think is happening in a situation, and the emotions that they're experiencing. And that's why studying this area might help us to communicate better. So what are metaphors? And what are these examples for you? So, so talking about this is talking uh, and potentially thinking about one thing in terms of another. Where the two things are different, but they form some sim similarity between them. So, for example, what is a, a metaphor that we, we this is one we found, um, this was in a, an online chat room. Uh, a person described themselves as a chemo veteran. Now, veterans in North American language mean people often who've served in the military. So they're drawing on here a language to say that they are uh, they're survivors. If you're a veteran, you've survived the war. Uh, but So they've survived the chemo experience and they're positioning it in terms of a military language. So it is used, metaphors used very much to talk about sensitive topics. Um, and they're used where it's very difficult to talk openly about a topic. You have metaphors in sex, for example. So if you want to talk about a promiscuous young man, you'll say he's off sowing his wild oats. Have you heard of that one? Yeah, doesn't mean he's a farmer. Okay, so it's nothing about farming, but we know what it means. Uh, and, uh, and we also use a method, which I'm not going to go into depth, about how to analyse and identify metaphor, which is based on a linguistics technique. So metaphors occur really commonly. 
And I'm sure that in just any conversation that you or I might have before or after this session, we would use metaphor. Uh, and, a, and a very common one that you will hear, or if you read the obituaries column, when you look at the newspaper tonight, you'll often see a person died after a long battle with cancer. She suffered heroically, something like that. So those are violence metaphors, we would categorize them. And um, so it reflects the kinds of thought process people have. And it also, different metaphors frame topics in different ways. So you can have um, a way to see a topic through a lens of a metaphor. And I'm going to give you some examples to explain this. So. For example, you have a lot to dig in and fight for, and you know and you can and will. Dust yourself down and prepare for the battle girl. This is from an online chat room for cancer patients. One cancer patient encouraging another cancer patient. Do you think this is a military metaphor? Right, so they're, so they're construing cancer treatment as a battle. This one's a journey metaphor. Sorry to hear that your partner is going through. Um, this person had malignant melanoma. It's a hard road to travel, both physically and mentally. Now, military metaphors were very, very common at one time. And people like Susie Sontag and others have written saying that we shouldn't use uh, uh, military metaphors because they position cancer and cancer treatment and cancer experiences as a, as a war, a battle. Uh, and in the US, you probably m mentioned, uh, there was a launched by the US president, the war against cancer. So cancer as, as a war to be fought, to be won, is, a, is one metaphor. And what we have now moved to, and particularly the end of life care strategy, has moved to a journey metaphor. And, and we'll start to demonstrate that for you. And the big question is, is one metaphor better than another? And we're, we're really not sure about this. So what was our data? How did we look at this? We um, used semi-structured interviews, um, uh, uh, which had already been collected with patients. We used online forum posts, which were public online fora. Um, things like Macmillan um, Cancer Support have online for uh, other ones as well. We didn't use anything that was password protected because we didn't want to violate any privacy. Um, we collected them from patients, from carers and from um, healthcare professionals. And as you can see, that uh, comes to an awful lot of words. Now, I do a lot of qualitative research, and usually I count my sample as quite big if I get to about 30 patients. So this is all represents an awful lot more data, uh, and is the kind of, um, so we did both a quantitative um, uh, type of analysis using techniques from linguistics, as well as looking at some of the qualitative aspects. So it was a very good learning exercise for me too. So we used a, a, a method, a, a tool, which is called eMargin, um, to annotate and to categorize some of our data. And I'm going to just keep going on from that. So this is how we might do it. So for example, um, looking at physical, there are services to pick up that needs. Um, and, and these are different types of metaphors. So we'd look at those would be physical, that length, size, links, loss, possession, burden. You can have all sorts of metaphors. And, and we underlined um, the one that we felt was appropriate. And we started to group them. So I won't read them all, but you can see. Money, exchange, value, body. These are all metaphors. And these are other ones. So containment, religion, sports. Sports and games are quite interesting to people who think about um, uh, the, the, the kind of present cancer treatment in terms of uh, a game, uh, a race to be won. 
a machine. So people talk about their bodies as machines. Bits of our bodies wears out or wears down, doesn't it? Um, so let's focus on these ones. So we're going to look now at violence and journey metaphors. So these are taken from our data sets uh, and we started to analyze and look carefully at them. So these would be examples and they we grouped all the violence ones together. They would be things like enemy, military, force, feuds. And these would be the ones that we allocated to a category of journey. So the illness is taking its course, movement, speed, direction, down and up. And uh, do you go down to death or do you go up to death? It's interesting how you use language in different ways. How does time go? Does it rush past you or do you rush forward? Um, an obstacle, so you get over it, location, closeness. So having done lots of this categorization or all of the, the data set we had using these um, methods of e-margin, annotating it, and something called W matrix, which is um, uh, a computer uh, tool where we went, and then you would end up with lots of text like that. So rather than in the kind of qualitative coding I'm looking for, I'm looking for meaning, I will group th and things together if I'm doing something like a grounded theory analysis. This is much more taking um, sections of text. And I'm not sure if it's possible for you to see, but there's, I haven't got a pointer, but you'll see there's all of these words here, if you can read them, they're all around violence and some aspects of military and what the other bits of text do is they set it in the context so we we highlight these words and then we look at what is it what's the meaning in the context that the words are in so there would be like general war shot missiles guns ammunition army all of those kinds of words and we would look at them really carefully because are they really talking about the war in Iraq or something, then they would be not about metaphor, they would be about something real. But if they're talking about their cancer or their end of life care experience, then we think that probably they're using that word metaphorically. So there we are, this person saying, on their final journey, you're now the general and you see your troops killed in battle. And this is a health professional talking. So I'm going to go on now. So that's a little bit about how we did our study. It is a, a complex and a process, and I've probably not done justice to the skills of my linguistics colleagues. But hopefully it gives you the feel that it was a very rigorous process with both some qualitative coding but also some searching using some specially designed um, tools. And now we're going to look at the good and the bad deaths in interviews for some of the hospice managers. So some of the interviews we did were with hospice managers. So we asked a series, we conducted a series of semi-structured interviews with 15 hospice managers and we asked them, could you describe a good death? How would you describe a bad death? and give you examples from experience. And what we were really interested in here was uh, the, the use of metaphor. And the first thing about, the, there were some often very general statements about the characteristics of a good or a bad death. So people had a vision of what that was and there were sort of generic na narratives about types of peoples and types of experience. And I kind of think this is quite interesting because uh, from my nursing background, one of the mantras in nursing is that everybody's an individual. 
Uh, and I expect that's a phrase that you've heard if you're a nurse. We treat everybody as an individual, they're all individuals. But actually when you get nurse managers or other managers to talk, often what they do is they talk in generic types. And they talk in kind of stereotypes of people. And, and that's absolutely what these people did. And we looked at the, the uh, metaphors. And metaphors were apparent in both the good narratives about a good death and also in a bad death, but there were more frequent and more elaborated narratives of a bad death. So it seems that people, there's something about all um, good deaths have a sort of similarity in the accounts of these hospice managers, but the bad deaths were much more individualized and specific. So metaphors help to describe the, the uh, use of this title, good or bad. And they, they were often uh, expressed in terms of evaluation. So good deaths were described in terms of peace, freedom. Um, uh, often that was facilitated by the staff. So uh, the, the hospice managers, perhaps not surprisingly to us as researchers, were attributing the good aspects of the death to the interventions that they as hospices provided. Uh, and this notion of openness. So peace, freedom, and openness were characteristics that were presented. And they would be terms that I think would be quite familiar and would be metaphors that would be very readily used about hospices. And metaphors were used really to normalize good deaths. And, and they were, were regarded as deaths were described as natural, a part of life, uh, and part of the journey. So they, they drew on the, the notion of a journey. And a bad deaths were often described in terms of violence. So they were a struggle, uh, people battled to the end. Um, so they were, and, and that was seen as bad. So going on a journey in which there was acceptance and openness and peace was seen as good. Going on a battle to the end was seen as bad. And metaphors were used, for example, in the badness death narratives, they were much more sensitive, painful, or emotional uh, than the good deaths. And these, these were often a ways to express the bad things, but without criticizing professionals or patients or carers too directly. So there were bad things that happened, but they were nobody's fault. So the kind of so what factor is um, good and bad deaths are linked to professional roles and challenges and views. And there were in our data this difference between journeys leading you to a good place and a good death and battles not being so good. Um, and, and how patients' experiences in this sense were framed. But our question after that work was, is that the way the patients and carers saw it? Is there a difference between the way patients and carers talk about their end of life care experiences? Um, and a good Beth may be one where the per person has absolutely fought up to the end is it, it, in their terms. Um, and if you have an early acceptance, is that indeed giving up? which may not be so seen as so good. And the professional's notion and valuing of openness, which is part of the kind of hospice philosophy about open disclosure, open communication, is that actually not so welcomed by patients and families um, who may feel that that's prying too much into them, or they just want to, keep things to themselves. So if I move us on to looking for the metaphors for carers. So the language, the, um, uh, the information we're using here 
Part of that was from the online fora and part of it was from um, interviews with, with family caregivers, which had been collected from another study, not specifically about this study. So once again, we looked at um, the language which expressed emotion in, these, um, in, these, in this data that we had. And this is an example. You have to go through this range of emotion or she had all this worry trapped inside her. Um, another journey one is driving myself round the bend. Uh, and that was in the context of worry. If you worry too much, you drive yourself round the bend. So you can see a journey there, can't you? Um, and, a, and, a, and this is a, a health um, professional. It still hurts every time a patient dies. So we had some research questions that we asked about uh, carers and health professionals' views of emotions. And we, we looked for family carers' emotions represented mostly outside as opponents. Um, for example, the carer said that really knocked us uh, both for six, a violence one there, or a location mostly by professionals for all parties to be in the right, in the right, the same place, psychologically at the same time. So, so there's a comparison there. So the carers are drawing on the notion, the metaphors of violence, the health professionals drawing on a journey or a place metaphor. And then come, mostly coming out with a tendency of carers to refer to them as being released in a safe, controlled environment. Um, it gives you a way of releasing stress and frustration. Professional also describing, uh, ascribing agency to carers. So when the anger is directed at people or institutions, for example. So what's the implications for emotions being construed as inside or outside the body, moving from the inside to the outside or vice versa? So we looked at this in the, in the language, in the data. So we, we put, this is kind of an evaluation, is emotions coming out with no agency on the part of the experiencer or misdirected emotions, negative emotions, and positively one would be shared emotional spaces. And hospices work quite hard to create those kind of spaces. So the emotion isn't, isn't a, the, our evaluation is not of the emotion itself, but it's how it's represented and the interpersonal consequences. So this is a little sort of plot where we're starting to look at how people ex experience motions, express motions, um, and whether they share experiences and what their consequences would be. So we looked at emotions, then we went on to look at violence and journey metaphors. And as I've noted before, these have been widely criticised. So uh, it's thought very much that we shouldn't be using violence metaphors anymore when we communicate with patients and, and cancer patients. We should not be using it in policy statements, in information leaflets to, to cancer patients, for example. This is just an example here about the victory over cancer. And it's not just uh, related to cancer, but on AIDS as well. And this is drawing on the work of um, Sontag, who was very much against these, these, uh, uh, the, the notion of violence in language. So if we look at uh, more recent work, it's this, the, there was a, a paper which said, speak up eight words and phrases to ban in oncology. 
maybe a paper you've read or looked at. And, and once again, it's arguing really strongly that we should give up, we shouldn't use violence metaphors. So we shouldn't use things like aggressive, we shouldn't use military metaphors. And these have been uh, avoided in UK documents like the end of life care strategy. And, and the language is turned to things like survivorship, and I've heard that today because some of you are working in the areas of survivorship. And we tend to use language now, instead of cancer victims, we talk about cancer survivors, uh, living with and beyond cancer. And these are some examples, for example, uh, uh, where, where notions of journey come in. Pathways. Everyone's on a pathway, livable care pathway, integrated care pathways. So those are the, the kind of new metaphors that are being used. Frontline actually is a military metaphor sneaking in there. Even though you think you're getting rid of them, they're, they're still there. Uh, and that's from the cancer reform strategy. So that's an example of how a, uh, a policy has looked at these kind of metaphors and uses them. And this is from, uh, once again, the end of life care strategy, chapter three, the end of life care pathway, specifically. Over the past few years, the concept of care pathway has been found useful, um, talking about approach, a pathway, and specifically not using um, notions of a battle, a war. Although sometimes there's some interesting um, uh, kind of people using mixed metaphors. Did you find your journey a battle or a steady work uh, woman like trudge? So there's either a battle or a journey in there, isn't it? Trudging. However, both in the wider public debate and also uh, on our data, we found that there are some voices who say that actually military or violence fighting metaphors may have their use for certain people. And this is a person um, who's talked a lot about, uh, if you're looking at YouTube or social media, you can find her talking. Um, about the heroic narrative of death and I think she's talking about her partner's death and she's find, she finds that very useful to talk about it in terms of a battle. So these are some examples. We fought, we struggled, we triumphed. So it's, it's making the, um, the, the, the experience into a heroic um, endeavour. It was an exhilarating fight, and I repeated the fight today without a moment's hesitation. We fought together, we lived together. So in that, in that person's case, and it was very public, they were saying that there's actually a virtue in the fight metaphor, because it was helpful, it was empowering. Just totalling up our data, we looked at the differences. What are the differences of um, warfare metaphors used by patients, carers, and professionals? And it's really interesting differences. These are our very large data sets. And um, you can see that professionals in the UK use um, war metaphors much less than patients and families. So patients and families are still using war metaphors, health professionals less so. And they, that's a statistically significant difference, but um, uh, that's because we got a large data set. So let's look at some of these violence metaphors, because it's been argued that we shouldn't use them because they're disempowering to people. So one of the things we can think about is the degree to which a person has agency. By agency, I mean they are directing what happens. Or are they being a passive person in this process? How are they positioning themselves? So 
we're looking for an increase or de decrease in the degree of ag uh, agency that somebody has. So, uh, uh, and for agency can be used for somebody's benefit because having control, uh, perceived control, uh, and having agency is often thought to be a, uh, a psychologically better position for somebody to be in than being, for example, a passive victim of what is happening to them. So agency or a lack of agency could be, and when it's expressed grammatically in the language, that's one way to look at it and find it, could be a determinant as to how people are using metaphors and whether they are good or not good in the sense of whether they, it's a violence metaphor or a journey metaphor. So this is about, let me just put these up for you. Whoops, I should go back. Let's see if I can go back. Let's see, previous. So this is patient data where it's probably not a good thing that they're having t uh, a lot of violence metaphors because they have too many battles. So the disease against the patient, the treatment and doctors are perceived as against the patient, the patient against the disease, and the patient against hospitals or the situation. So it's interesting, one patient saying, my secret weapon is keeping the ultrasound at the hospital on side. So that's, a, that's agency. Oh, I've done it again. So patient data, and once again, patients against health professionals, we won that battle, but imagine what it'd be like if she hadn't had a family to defend her. Um, so, so that's seeing uh, the situation as a confrontation, not a collaboration at all. Patient against family and friends, and patients against themselves. I think that's kind of an interesting one, and wasn't one I expected to see at all. So the patient is talking about, I'm destroying myself with my mind. Right now, I'm torturing myself. If I woke up this morning and gave myself a large kick. So they're talking about themselves uh, as, as objects. But is, are all battles bad? So these are violence metaphors and disempowerment. I feel such a failure that I'm not willing, winning this battle. It must be dispiriting when you're battling as hard as you can and not to give them the armour to fight in. And, and one of the ones that we found most alarming in our data set is a person who described herself as, I'm a walking time bomb. And that's about their, their experience of cancer. And if they saw themselves in that way, what's it saying something about their psychological frame? Um, and these are much more violence metaphors, which are potentially empowering. And I'm not sure if you'll agree with me on this, but, uh, but a person describing themselves, I'm such a fighter. Um, my consultants recognize that I'm a born fighter, uh, and so on. So, you know, uh, I don't, I, I want to fight it, I don't want it to beat me, I want to beat it. It's talking about it being cancer. And those are very familiar to any of you who've talked with cancer patients, probably. So, in that way, they position, so the agency is with them. So this is once again also using military uh, metaphors but as, as um, solidarity and encouragement. So some of the people signing off on social media said, soldier on everybody, or encouraging people, you're such a fighter. Um, glad to hear you're still smiling, still winning that battle. So these are positive um, images perhaps of the fighting metaphor. Um, interestingly, patients gave themselves ranks. 
You know, if you actually talk to health professionals, most of the doctors think they're generals or commandants or something, and, and that isn't always the way. So these are texts with patients, and they describe themselves in terms of being the brigadier, the colonel, the commandant, and so on. So it's not always health professionals who have the, have the high ranks, the military ranks. So this is a, a patient from uh, social media say, I would promote you, but I think you've reached the top rank already, and I can't think of any other ranks. So this is people encouraging themselves, drawing on military uh, metaphor. So what about journey metaphors? So cancer is a journey. Have you all heard that, I'm sure? Yeah, it's very, very prevalent. When I'm teaching groups of nurses, many of them don't even realize that that is a metaphor. It's not real. Patients don't really go on journeys. <laughs> they don't buy a ticket with Ryanair. Uh, it's not a journey, it's a metaphor. And I think with that sometimes is really important. Like they really weren't fighting, but, and they are really not going on a journey. But this is just metaphors. So this is a, a complicated one. So cancer is a journey. Some people have similar experience to others on that journey, but by and large, the journey has many twists and turns. And that means that no people, two people go on the same route. And I think it's trying to drive a coach and horses uphill with no back wheels on the coach. You need to stop occasionally and rest the horses. Review the situation with your husband. This is a lovely example of journeys. These are all metaphors. She wasn't really driving a coach with horses. But this is a good way, this wonderful example. And patients and families see themselves as traveling companions. And actually, if you look at the first book that was produced on the Liverpool Care Pathway, it just it says companions on the journey as the subtitle. It's a metaphor. I'm not sure they realized it, but it is a metaphor. So that awful journey going through safe, uh, this is a signing off at the end of a social media saying safe journey or keep battling on. That's another one. Uh, you're not alone. I've walked the same path as you. Uh, continue to str uh, strength to everyone on this journey. Although interesting that last one had slay the breast cancer beast. So there was a bit of fighting in there too. Um, and their patients are about guiding each other. And this is about solidarity and encouragement. So there's good things about journey metaphors. So there's rocks on the paths. They're heading in the right way. It's a path. It's a journey. So illness in this sense is construed about having um, traveling companions on the journey. Um, and grieving is also construed, grieve, we haven't looked in depth about all the, the bereavement literature, but that would be interesting, because grief is often described and seen as a journey, a tunnel that people pass through, a dip in the road, climbing the hill out of bereavement. <laughs> and these are some examples from professional ones, so professionals guide patients on this journey. Um, and these are sort of journey metaphors and disempowerment. So, for example, about, I've not done so well with my own cancer journey through the wilderness of my own local hospitals. So let's draw some of this together for you. So there's... Uh, I think there's a balance to be struck between what a journey and violence metaphors. In themselves, they are used regularly by all three groups of people in our data. Health professionals, patients and carers. Patients rather more use of violence metaphors than, than um, health professionals. But there's no single good metaphor in fact, what we're trying to work on at the moment is a metaphor menu, and we're working with local clinicians to help them understand that people use metaphor in different ways. And that violence metaphors are not all wrong and shouldn't be banned, because for some people they can be empowering. 
And journey metaphors are not all good. That they can also be disempowering for some people. Um, and what we need to look for is metaphors that enable people to have a sense of agency. And it's also helpful as a health professional to listen to the metaphors that people, or patients and families are using to you and reflect those back so to show that you've understood. So the so what? So what does it all mean? So there's both negative and positive attitudes and emotions are expressed in terms of the two metaphors that we've, that we've looked at, the violence and the journeys. Uh, and a blanket rejection of violence metaphors is perhaps not appropriate because they do have these positive function and an uncritical acceptance of the journey one is equally inappropriate. And the key thing we need to help people is have a sense of agency and not become passive in the process of communicating with health professionals or communicating themselves to other people because often the communication we were looking at was to with other cancer patients not necessary to health professionals so if we think about the implications of policy and practice there needs to be an awareness that metaphors are present in all policy documents and i hope after today you can go and look at a policy document and start to spot those metaphors in there in a way that maybe you hadn't thought of them as metaphors before it's really easy to do just get your highlighter pen out and every time it says anything about a battle or a fight or a journey or a pathway or an uphill struggle or something that's a metaphor. <laughs> so there aren't good and bad in a simplistic way. Um, think about your own assumptions. Think about the way you use metaphor when you communicate with patients and families. And listen particularly for the metaphors that they're using to you. So if they're reflecting to you that they see it as a battle, and they're winning, it's a battle that they're proud to be part of, and they're the general leading out the, the big guns, that's probably okay because they have a sense of agency. If they're seeing it as a battle in which they're not winning and um, they, they feel passive and it's, uh, all is exploding around them and their body is a time bomb, that can be challenged by you. So I'm going to end with just a few things to encourage you to do, to come and hear more research at the EAPC Congress, which is in Copenhagen next year. Uh, and um, we, we very much look forward to welcoming you there in May. Hope you'll make it. Uh, and we're going to be in Dublin. The EAPC will be coming to Dublin in 2016 for the World Research Congress. So that's not so far for you to journey. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>